courtroom. Please allow me. My name is Zuzsa Vopera. I uh, am a professor at the um, uh, Faculty of Law at the University of Mishkolz, and I am working, obviously, in the field of law, and mostly I'm working in the field of family law in procedural um, law. So when I started to th uh, think about this topic, I thought that we really have to start by saying that a courtroom is never a place for children. You can't hear. You can't hear at all. Oh, yeah, you can. Okay, my higher. <laughs> okay. So, so the courtroom. Um, we have done lots of steps in order to make the courtrooms much more child-friendly, much more embracing the children. Or Adrian sometimes said that maybe we should call it a child-centric. Uh, sit, um, situation. Um, the European Court of Justice have issued a guideline on the child-friendly courtroom, as and we have considered it and transposed this into the Hungarian regulatory framework in um, in our work. So during our discussion, we are going to talk about civil. Uh, uh, about the civil court related issues. We are not going to talk about criminal law at all. So, so when it comes to child-friendly courts and justice systems, lots of things have ha been done. However, the explosion of the situation was on the 1st of August this year. Actually, it was in September mainly, uh, when there it was highly portrayed in the media that uh, the children are interviewed uh, in the in the court and they have to share their views on uh, the divorce case of their parents. And of course, um, from the legal terminology point of view, all these media articles were uh, absolutely incorrect. And then there are lots of people in, in the court and what happened, what happened to the child-friendly justice um, system. And uh, the poor children have to make a decision on whether or not they want to uh, move uh, in with dad or mom. And there is a conflict of loyalty. So all these things appeared in the media in these articles. However, at the same time, we are all aware especially those of us here present, is that since 1991, the, convention, the UN Convention on the Right of the Child has been also part of the Hungarian legislative system. And one of the articles is actually very much laying down the foundations for our work, namely to involve the children into court cases. So when it comes to divorce cases or supervisory right, um, when decisions are made about the children, obviously it has a huge impact on that right. So I believe that there are much more authentic people around this table here today who can talk about this issue. Please allow me to introduce them. So to discuss how children can feel safe in civil case, court cases. Well. The idea is that we would just build up our discussion in such a way that we start with the um, letter the children receive saying, Dear Gergo, dear Boglarka, you have the opportunity to do this and that. So this is, of course, the first step in this whole procedure. What would be the first step for maybe not the child, but for the parents? How can we see that they understand what's happening and how we can guide this child through this entire procedure? from the moment um, he or she received this letter. So first of all, I would like to uh, introduce Eva Shub uh, Shubashit, attorney, uh, the Hungarian Lawyers Associations of, um, with the expertise of family and ch uh, children's rights, and as a prosecutor, 
Um, um, she has a uh, great expertise in, the, in this field. And now moving on, uh, Ms. Adrian Varai Yogos uh, is a judge at the past Central District Court. She's a head of unit. And with Adrian, we have known each other for quite a long time because she is very much of an expert of um, international family affairs. And in the past 16 or 17 years, I think, she is a first instance, she has been a first instance judge, and I think you have, she has seen it all. And she's famous, actually, I would like to mention, for being the one who basically established a practice in Hungary that is uh, very uh, common in Germany that she interviews the children herself. So um, she is the person who can talk about its challenges. So and now, last but not least, I'd like to introduce Katalin Ochko, who is the deputy uh, president of the Budapest uh, Metropolitan Regional Court in Hungary. And I think you have been in this profession as a judge for 28 years, both in first and second instance. So if someone is an authentic in this area in Hungary, then it's you. So I'm very pleased that you accepted our inv invitation. So on behalf of the organizers, I'd like to thank you for that. And now. As I mentioned, we will go through the entire procedure, procedure. So the letter is sent to the child. So what can the parent do in order to make sure that the child is safe? Good evening, everyone. We do hope that Pishti and Gergo's parents will not hear from the media what happens next to the child. So that's not the source of information for them. But if they have a legal representative, they will contact this legal representative. I think that it is a huge milestone that we are experiencing now in the Hungarian legislative framework. Because the right of children was very much present in the Hungarian legislation. However, now we came to the, uh, got to a point that even the actual involvement of children in the procedure is actually happening. So at uh, the level of the law, it has been present for quite a while, but it wasn't part of a legal act. So, and now, when this letter is sent to the child, so when the child is notified what sort of procedure is has been initiated between the two parents, well, this is what has been um, described in the media that you refer to. I believe that this new piece of legislation is quite recent, of course, and everyone who is now applying the law is still in on a steep learning curve. However, it is very important to interpret this notification uh, by the parents. What do we expect from this? We hope that parents who have not, had not been in a situation like this before would be able to share the appropriate information with children. Unfortunately, there are parents who are undergoing a divorce and there is so much tension there. And even though they are responsible parents, they can't really share all the details with the children. Uh, so we can't, they can't really tell them what's happening, what's next. Uh, and of course, and of course, a lot of people first think that um, it uh, it in this sort of notification means right away that the child will be interviewed. But that's not the, uh, what it necessarily means. And for us, legal professionals, our task is to provide information as much as possible to the parent what exactly this letter, this notification means. And the fact that we want to hear the views of the child is very important. And I think it's very, very important what I have just mentioned, because a lot of parents w want to make decisions without knowing 
the opinion of the child. That's what we see on a daily basis in our work. And often we can see that actually what the parents decided upon did not serve the interest of the child. So the question is that when the child is notified concerning the opportunity of making declarations, and that's not how it was portrayed in the media. Um, it was portrayed that we forcefully dragged this poor child to court, but that's not what's happening. So anyway, so what Eva just said, this notification only uh, happens in a case when there is lots of tension between the parents. But the question is, do we need to request the opinion or hear the opinion of uh, the child when the parents are in agreement, when they know how they want to proceed? So uh, when we interpret the law, that is always an issue that we keep talking about. And as far as I understand, the deputy president actually has a case she would like to share with us exactly on this very issue. Thank you. Yes, I do want to share this case with you. It happened um, a long time ago, so before August, when the uh, law was modified. Actually, first of all, I'd like to mention that this particular letter is not at all a novelty for uh, people living in Budapest, because for children above the age of 14, only deci uh, decisions can only be m made concerning the placement of the child with, with either of the parents with their consent, unless obviously it's against their own interest. I work for the Budapest court for many, many years. And even back then, then we wrote letters and these kind of notifications to the children. And now in connection with this letter, I would like to touch upon a lot of issues. But first of all, I'll share that particular story with you. So uh, the case um, involves um, parents who have university degrees. They are rather calm. They made their agreements in their divorce case where they share their decisions with us, how they want to go through this divorce. And then I raise the same questions I always do, whether or not they inform their child about this decision. Is the child aware of this decision? Is the child aware how his or her everyday life will be in the future. The reason why I explained that they had university degrees, because it was quite surprising that the answer was, no, no, actually we didn't, because we just discussed it. And then I made the decision that I would not approve their agreement. First, I told them to go home, to share this information with this child who was about two, 12 or 13 at the time, if I remember correctly. Anyway, so I told them to, to share their opinion with the child, how they want to settle the situation, and then they should return to me. And when they came back to me, it turned out that that's not what the child wanted. So I decided to, to interview the child, and after learning his or her opinion, after a couple of hours, I was basically acting as a medi mediator, and I was able to reach a consensus, an agreement, which uh, both the father and the mother agreed to. But I was able to represent the interest of the child because I was aware of his or her opinion, and I actually perf I was uh, I complied with the obligation that wouldn't have been my obligation because I wasn't the parent, but they were cooperative. So this is very important, and I think this case is important because even in the case when the parents actually have an agreement, even then we need to ask the opinion of the child. I did not want to provoke you, but uh, I just remember this uh, case so clearly, and it had such a huge 
impact on me, that I thought that it's a very good representation of what we are doing, that even though the civil code in Article 148 um, sets out that the parents must involve the children in the decision-making process, process, but if it does not happen, and it's, that's what this new regulation is all about, this notification, so there is no distinction made between a situation when the parents are in agreement or a situation when they are not in agreement. And now I'd like to ask you, from Audrey M mainly, because you have great experience in this field, so in hearing the children. So anyway, what sort of difficulties have you encountered? What are, how should I say it? So how, so what does it look like in, in practice? And what's your experience? Well, what I noticed at the beginning of my career, uh, I dealt with international family affairs, that there it was much more accepted that the children should be heard. So if one party was a foreigner, or both parties were foreigners, uh, then for them it was absolutely normal that the five-year-old, their five-year-old child should be heard uh, in a special courtroom for children. For the Hungarian part, in case of the Hungarian part, it was not so obvious. Uh, in their case, uh, time was needed, and it is still so, because many think that it would be a trauma for the child to go to, go to court and be heard there. And what I noticed that actually the, the children can really well express what they want. Um, so they can really formulate their opinions very well. I have many stories that I could share with you in this regard. Uh, either directly or indirectly, the court listens to the child. It's always up to the judge to decide whether the judge him or herself or would, will hear, will listen to the child, or uh, with the involvement of a psychologist. Um, uh, basically, normally, I do the hearing myself, but in every case, it's different. Normally, towards the end of the court proceedings, I listen to the child, and uh, after uh, hearing the witnesses and the parties when I have all the evidence so when I can really ask relevant questions with the target that uh, that if possible the child should be only heard once and there are very strict rules in the procedural law how this uh, court hearing should be carried out so I always uh, listen to them without uh, parents and guardians present. So uh, it's uh, what I can tell you is that when I informed the parties about what the child said to me, then it's always a very, uh, a very emotional moment in the whole court proceedings because I tell the parties what their child told me and then the parties often tell me I, I thought my child does not see this, does not feel this and it's it's very rare that the, that the parents do not cry when I tell them what the child told me. And I, I wouldn't say always, but very often afterwards, uh, the parents say, "Now let's uh, let's end this whole procedure," and they 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 settle the matter back at home. So very often, when the child tells me what he or she wants. And, and how he or she feels about this whole procedure and about the behavior of the parents. And very often we just stop and it comes to an amicable divorce, to an amicable settlement. So it's a very emotional moment. Well, it's really surprising. Uh, so this, uh, this law on civil procedures, there are, uh, there are strict rules about how children can be heard at court. Uh, we are uh, members of a workshop on family matters. It's like a huge family. There are other members of the workshop too, Krista and Marcy too. And, uh, and often we discuss about this issue mentioned by Adrian. Um, 
how, what kind of a pressure is there on the child? Uh, so on, on, on the ways uh, as uh, the child is neither witness nor a part participating in the procedure, so uh, how the child feels that uh, his or her uh, statement will be revealed to to the parent. So if there would be a situation, maybe the parallel is not so good that uh, the the the. the uh, the statement, the declaration by the child should be dealt with confidentially. It's a question whether in that case the the child uh, uh, would have less uh, emotional pressure on themselves. But at the same time, this precise effect that Adrian just mentioned, that very often the statement by the child motivates the parents to, to settle their, their issue amicably. There, so this would definitely this couldn't take place in that case. You mentioned these court rooms, these hearing rooms for children. Uh, each and every court has such a room. What can you tell us about this? How many are there? How do they look like? So what can you tell us about these? Well, these are hearing rooms for children. Um, what I can tell you about these? Anyone can look up this on the internet. There are 58 such in rooms in the country, which means uh, that one belongs to each and every court, but not in, for every district court. Very often, these rooms are not only used for hearing children, but also for uh, mediating processes or witnesses are waiting there. Of course, the best would be if this room is only for children, so with wall decorations adequate for this purpose. For, for example, at our court, it is a, a really comfortable, very children friendly. So when the child arrives, I always took the child by the hand and showed him or her this room and also the courtroom. And then already the child felt how important this issue is. And I, I, I asked and I um, uh, told him that he or she can choose in which room he would like to be or she would like to be heard. And this already eased the tension. Uh, many children, mainly above the age of 10, but sometimes I also the children at the age of Eight, uh, chose the courtroom because they said, I've never been at the court before. How interesting it is. Please show me your hammer. Please uh, uh, show me your gown. And can I try it on? Uh, I never use it since uh, a six-year-old little boy told me that, oh, you look like a scarecrow. And, and uh, this boy was so right in this long black gown. I was really shocked. I, was, I had a shocking look. So these uh, hearing rooms for children, um, mainly the, the, the practice road changes. Uh, the current standpoint is that too many toys, too many impulses, too many books are not good. Um, because the attention of the child cannot focus on what is necessary. Because uh, before the hearing, I should get to know the child. That's the main aim. We never ask them direct questions. Uh, we always have closed end questions. So we never ask closed end questions, but open questions um, that help communication. Just let me share with you one more example, and then I'll hand over the microphone. Uh, there was an eight-year-old little boy who wanted to be heard. Uh, this is not a recent case. But still, when the boy came to us for one and a half hours, didn't say anything. He was totally pale. I gave him tea, a little snack, and whatever I asked him for one and a half hours, he didn't respond to anything, and I almost gave up. And then suddenly he came to my lap, sat into my lap. We always sit next to one another, um, so with the child, so that uh, no kind of superiority 
be felt, can be felt by uh, the child. So he sat into my lap and he did not see me because he turned away his face from mine because it, I was a stranger, of course, to him, so he couldn't be honest that way. And for over an hour, he sat in my lap. I did not dare to move. I should have taken notes, but I said it is so precious, this, uh, this uh, um, position. So for, o- for over an hour, he talked to me with his face turning away. He told me, and we both cried at the end. So there are so many emotional stories I could, sh- I could share with you. And now, well, in our uh, Pest Centre District Court, uh, we have two such uh, hearing rooms for children. One is for the children under the age of 12 uh, with, with more toys, but of course not too many. And there is one for children above the age of 12 with more books and, and, and round table. And uh, the psychologists help us uh, uh, in in creating these spaces and uh, I also could share a lot of stories with you I I, I, I actually remember all my cases when I had to hear children Um, mainly I I was just thinking about this practice what my colleague does what we just heard so uh, normally I take them to an f- upper floor, but once there was a 17-year-old girl uh, with a divorce that was full of conflicts, full of tension, and I, I thought that she is old enough, already 17 year old, and I asked her, would you like to uh, go into the courtroom or into this special hearing room for children? And she looked at me and told me, I, I, I don't want to go into the, this, this room where my, my, my parents are shouting at one another. And following this, we went into this special room for children. And just another story. There was a 10-year-old girl who, who had an issue that uh, so uh, neither the mother nor the father uh, could have taken care of the child. So in this case, the judge has to appoint a third person for taking care of the child. And, and before the court case, the grandmother said that the, the child is so full of sen- uh, tensions and so anxious and maybe uh, doesn't want this whole process. And, and according to law, then they, of course, obviously there is no, no hearing takes place with the child. And then I asked, would it be okay to go to the fourth floor to look at the special room for children? And we have a conversation during that. And once we are in this room, the child can decide uh, what year he wants. And if she doesn't want to stay, then she go go back to the grandmother and nothing really will happen. And then uh, I was told that this is okay this way. So we went to the fourth floor. Uh, we were having a conversation. I showed her the room. And then I asked her, what's your decision? And then she said, I would like to stay. And uh, we are talking about a really, really difficult childhood. So it was really hard listening to her story. And uh, once she finished, we just sat there. And I had the feeling I cannot just, just let, let her go now after this, this hearing. And now we go back to the grandmother and all the whole proceedings can continue. So I just told her, I, I, I feel how difficult it must have been for you. Yes, it was not easy, she responded. And then I told her that very often we as adults also have to face challenges that are difficult for us. And you already as a child had to face such challenges. But please never forget, I told her, how smart you were, how honest you were, and uh, that you, you did this, that you were here, you expressed your opinion. Uh, you, you you have a high level of emotional intelligence. You were much more mature than your peers. 
uh, because you live through much more things than other 10 year olds and then I brought her back to her grandmother and then the grandmother said thank you very much the child is so happy now and her tension has eased so much and it was such a happiness for me to uh, to say goodbye to her uh, with this feeling that she's she's fine now I cannot reflect really on uh, the hearing of children as I'm a uh, legal representative, but I can talk about the consequences and the, uh, the, the story leading to this uh, concerning children at the age of 14. Um, um, we, we did take steps because uh, we thought that the parents uh, uh, have a huge response, have a responsibility, a certain responsibility, not we as legal representatives. And it was an earlier practice in jurisprudence that if the child during this expert investigation said that uh, we know what in, in she or he, he knows what questions he or she can expect, then this can mean a kind of influence. At least this is what experts uh, thought, even if it was not necessary to. So if the child had opinion, uh, then uh, during the an expert's investigation, it was not necessarily a clear opinion. Rather, it was a sign uh, of uh, maybe having uh, gone through an influence by one of the parties. So I guess that in the work of legal representatives, a change of mindset will be necessary, all the more in the case of experts. But since uh, this uh, law that, uh, came into, uh, that became effective on the 1st of August, I have had two issues. Uh, that uh, uh, the, the child was brought to me into my attorney's office before bringing, it, uh, bringing uh, him or her to anywhere else. And as we, as I or my colleagues, we do not have the same uh, experience as the judges sitting next to me. And irrespective of how many years you've been dealing with family matters, uh, uh, one is not prepared because uh, the children react in, in, in very different ways. And it's very difficult to lead conversations if you do not know what you can expect. Obviously, we need to help, but at the same time, we need to keep distance from the emotional involvement. And what was even more important is that children are always in search of her safety and they really want to know what's happening and they want someone to tell them what's going to happen next. So, and I think that's our responsibility. So from the moment they enter the, the courtroom and obviously they are welcomed by our, our colleagues, we need to provide as much information as they require in order to make sure that they can be as relaxed as possible, obviously considering the circumstances. Chris is looking at me. I don't know why. But anyway, yeah, when, when I said the word relaxed, obviously relaxed is not really the right word. But anyway, so at least they should be as much informed as possible. And I was actually quite annoyed about what was published a size in the media. Obviously, it was very much unprofessional. And even though I was not, I'm not a psychologist, even though I wanted to be, but it doesn't matter. So anyway, so there were um, ideas coming from psychologists in these uh, articles, which basically hinted that we are traumatizing. Um, the children and us lawyers, we can see that it is not the court and the judges that um, uh, that traumatize the children, but it is the parents or the environment who allow things to escalate. And uh, we've also heard that the, that, the, uh, that the lawyers actually want to make these conflicts even deeper and more tense. Obviously, there, are may, there may be some lawyers who 
are like that, but obviously, generally, that's not the approach. And of course, it's also our objective to make sure that we reach a uh, situation that is the safest and the best for the child. We do want to catch up with some of our delays, and uh, therefore, well, I would like to mention that in the past, the judicial practice concerning the notification sent to the child was as follows. Okay. Every judge, of course, has his or her own approach and skills. And obviously, the judge formulates the notification that is sent to the children. However, in the child, uh, child right cabinet of the uh, um, in national judges board, um, we are now in the process of elaborating basically templates that the judges can send out as notifications. And we strongly believe that it will really help um, their work. And obviously, it's not obligatory, but it might be a useful resource for the judges. Of course, we will involve a psychologist in this work as well. Obviously, I think this will be very useful in our practice. Even though I, there are lots of best practices, not just horrible notifications that we've heard in the media. For example, I'd like to mention the court in Mishkort, not partly because that's my hometown, but anyway, so they have best, pra uh, best practice. I really like it. You might be debatable. So in the case of a child below the age of 14, they do not mention what sort of procedure there are between the parents. But it starts by saying your parents will tell you what the court is going to decide upon. Uh, so it shouldn't be up to the judge to tell the child, but the parents. So the point I was trying to make here is that in the case of the court of Mishkorts and the notification they are sending out to children, um, also another important aspect is included, namely that they encourage the child to contact a family member or a friend or a teacher or a um, headmaster he or she trusts. And um, he should tell this person, this trusted person, uh, or uh, the phone number of the judges, and they should uh, be in contact. And I talked to a judge who said that in his or her practice, it did happen that a 12-year-old asked a headmaster to call the court, and then in the course of this conversation, it turned out that the child was abused uh, or a victim of domestic violence in the family. Um, and I think um, the, um, the, uh, the right of the expression of opinion of the child, according to Article 12, is of major importance. And when it comes to, for example, negligence, it is so very important because that's when it can surface if we listen to the child. Anyway, so now we are running out of time. The, my next question is uh, concerning your experience of this new legal situation. So the modification took into force in, uh, as of the 1st of August. So what is the experience you made? Well, how active are the children? Do they speak out or do they do anything? Before, well, today's Thursday, right? So on Tuesday, I, I met one of my older colleagues from the court of Budapest, and uh, she mentioned that she uh, handled four cases in two days, out of which uh, she heard nine kids. Every single time, the kids said that they want to come. It's great. They are very active, these kids. And uh, she told me that there was a heartbreaking story of a girl. She was 16, and she did nothing, but she was just sitting there crying for 20 minutes. And she said that she doesn't dare to cry in front of her parents, and she has no friend where she can basically release this horrible tension. And she just thanked the judge that she could cry, and then she left. If that's all what we achieve with this, but even that is important. Or there were 
um, a set of siblings, four and a half, the younger one, and the 12, the other one. And obviously, with the 12-year-old, the judge could have a conversation with. At the same time, the four-year-old uh, four boy was just uh, playing with the trams. And every now and then, he just um, contributed with just a word, whether or not he agreed with his sibling. So, well, I'm sure Adrian will be very, um, will be able to share more I information with us because um, the court where she's active has more experience in this field. But anyway, so I believe that what is very important, and this uh, should be our mission, namely, it is a great thing that this modification opened up a very important door for children that the New York Convention is actually applied at court so that um, children can come to court, they can be heard, they have the options, but they don't have to. And one of my colleagues men, uh, uh, told me a story about an eight-year-old boy who said that he was so happy that he could share his views and feelings. He doesn't really want to formulate any opinion. He just wants to talk about his feelings. I think it's wonderful. And I think we need to understand that when it comes to court hearings, it's n this is not a battlefield for parents where, well, we just give yet another situation to the child when he has to participate in this battle between the parents, but rather we want to provide the opportunity to the child where we can listen to him, and if it's not, and his opinion is not against his interest, then it will be incorporated in the decision. Well, yes, we um, represent the largest family affair groups. I have loads of um, experience in this field. We even send this kind of notification to kindergarten age children, and we send it to both parents. So uh, regardless of where the child lives, we believe um, and the parents should be aware of it. Obviously, in the case of a, children, uh, of a child um, who is uh, kindergarten age, uh, we will ask the parents to read it out loud. And then, of course, in their case, we do lots of drawings and um, and the parents hold their hands. And for example, recently I sent uh, two notifications to uh, children. In one case, uh, the kindergarten-aged child grew up actually uh, in a divorced household because right after his birth, the parents uh, were already separated. And the parents shared this information with this boy that well, that it really works, and both parents um, share their views with us that they wanted a child to come to the court and they wanted a child to share his feelings. And the child said that it's all fine with him, and you could really see that he has no idea that there could be any other way because he grew up this way, so that was his natural way of living. There was another case that was less simple, and uh, the kindergarten age child told me that his message to me is that they, he doesn't want um, his parents to get divorced, and he wants them to stay together, of course, but he doesn't want to come. I think I did my best not to uh, make them divorce, but I had no chance. Uh, usually, primary age children write letters, and they are usually very, very cute. And they say, I love mom and my dad too. Mom bought nice clothes for me, but I can play with dad, and, and I want this and that. And we always make sure that what has been said before, that there are certain questions we mustn't ask, and we really make sure that we don't. And actually, one of the cases that was quite difficult for me was when uh, when the child came and uh, uh, even though in my notification I said that um, they need to um, notify me that the child would uh, join us, but they didn't and he just showed up. But obviously I wouldn't send this child home because he came to talk to me. And then he said that um, it was a teenager 
Anyway, so he said he wanted to come because he wanted to see the room where they, his parents would get divorced. And also he said that he wants to formulate certain things. He discussed it with his parents. He is well aware that what the parents want, and it's okay for him. However, he wants to justify why it would be good for him. And actually, it was quite interesting afterwards because he also formulated other requests, both towards the mother and the mother concerning how to celebrate his birthdays, how to keep contact with his siblings, also about his dad's birthday, how he wants to celebrate his dad's birthday. However, he did not formulate any requests concerning mom's birthday. Well, mom went, mom went through so much, so I'm not sure that I can request her to allow me to celebrate her birthday as the four of us, so maybe I shouldn't talk about her. And I think it was really, really important because the parents could get additional information. We always learn from these cases. Um, well, how shall we send this notification? To whom? Um, we have so much to learn. For example, last time when I was just about to say I will send uh, a notification to the child, then I was told that actually, even though it's a three-year-old or child, but he doesn't speak yet, so he's non-verbal. So again, yet another thing I needed to learn. Thank you for the members of the panel discussion. I think we were able to create a bit of an idea about the safety of children in the courtroom. Thank you very much for I'm Anna Samopor. Uh, and I'm a teaching assistant at, and a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Law, University of Ljubljana, Slovenia. Um, and in addition to my teaching obligation, I also run the uh, faculty's legal clinic for refugees and foreigners. Uh, and my PhD research actually focuses on children's rights in connection to refugee law. Um, but I was not asked today um, to talk about refugee law and children's rights law, but to present to you um, relatively new legal concept in the Slovenian legal system, uh, the concept of child advocacy. So we've heard uh, the panel, they talked a lot about uh, child participation uh, in court proceedings. And this is, I, I, from what I heard, I see that Slovenia is still kind of in diapers when it comes to uh, providing spa space for children to actually participate and give their voice in decisions that affect their lives and their uh, rights and their interests. Um, but since 2007, a uh, Slovenian ombudsperson started a pilot project that's called Child Advocacy. And it's, uh, the main purpose of Child Advocacy is to provide uh, the opportunity of, for children that are involved in legal proceedings to actively participate and to meaningfully express their views in those um, situations. Um, the legal framework, however, the pilot project started in 2007, the legal framework is relatively new. It, it was laid down in 2017, so it's really hard to talk about whether it is successful or not, but the first reports are really promising. Um, so what exactly is child advocacy? Who is a child advocate? A child advocate can be anyone who has experience in working with children, usually these are social workers, um, and anyone who passes a special exam for, for being a child advocate. Uh, and their main role and they, their main task is to provide a safe space for a child. They're independent um, experts and they work with the child and try to get a statement from the child. So, so they are independent from courts, they're independent from parents, um, they're not expert wit witnesses, they're not legal representatives or lawyers, they're just a special per person who talks with the child. And then um, what happens is that the child gives their statement and this child advocates communicates the statement um, to the relevant authority that is making the decision. Usually that's family courts or centers for social work. Um, what is really important is that child advocates are obliged to inform the child about what is going on and what the purpose of this whole process is. Um, and another really important thing is that the child advocates 
need to make sure, they have an obligation to make sure that the decision maker actually took the child's views into account. Um, so the whole purpose of child advocacy is to, pro to implement, to fully implement Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, because while protection of children as specifically vulnerable individuals was really embedded in the Slovenian legal system, as well as in the minds of the decision makers, child's right to be heard has been left kind of on the margins, has been a bit neglected in the past. And the human rights ombudsperson tried to correct this, this with this pilot project and really provide a space for, for children to um, participate in important decisions that affect their lives. Um, so when is a child advocate appointed? Um, anyone, anyone can give an initiative to the, um, to the human rights ombudsperson. Um, if they see a child or if they encounter a child that is unable to express their views. Um, and then the human rights ombudsperson is the one to uh, take a look at this proposal and say, okay, this child really needs an ad advocate in this process. Uh, usually these initiatives come from uh, family courts, family law courts, and centers for social work, sometimes even from the parents, which is really interesting, um, and sometimes even for ch from children, those of course who are well aware that this institute even exists. Um, but what is really important is that although, of course, child advocates are mostly needed in highly conflict situations, so in family law, uh, situation connected to divorce proceedings that are highly conflict. Um, a child advocate can be appointed at any time in a child's life, so about any legal decision that affects their um, position. Um, so once the human rights ombud person takes a look at this proposal and they appoint a child advocate, this whole process starts. And what happens is that the child and the advocate meet several times, uh, usually it's 10 or maybe less times, um, in a safe space, in a suitable place, um, and they kind of bond, um, and the child initially gives a statement. So the statement of the child forms through these meetings with um, the child advocate. And the child statements ac actually um, consist of anything that the child, child wants to um, the decision maker to know anything that they want to communicate in this decision-making process. So in family law proceedings, this includes, uh, for example, the child explains how they see the situation in the family, how they feel about their parents getting the, a divorce, where they want to spend their holidays, so anything that comes up to their mind. And another important thing is that the child advocate can never interpret the statement of the child. They are there only to communicate it as they heard it from the child. Um, the child's statement is um, communicated to the decision maker in a written form, together with a report of the child advocate. Um, and it can be also written, written by the child um, themselves. So the child is able to write it on their own. It depends on the situation. It depends on the age and maturity of the child as well. While the whole process of child advocacy of, is of course intended to get the child's statements, it is extremely important that the child is able to not give a statement at any point of the child advocacy process and they must be informed about it. Um, and another extremely important thing that um, is that the child has the right to limit the dissemination of the statement. So they have the right to say, okay, um, dear advocate, I want the decision maker to see, so I want the judge to see my statement and I don't want my parents to see this statement, which I think is really an uh, important part of child's autonomy, uh, of their option to choose who sees their statement and who doesn't. Um, so I want to be really brief with my conclusion. Um, because I, I think it's a bit boring for some of you to listen to an institute that um, is implemented in Slovenia in a neighboring country. Um, but I feel like it's, um, it could, can be a good alternative to hearing a child in a courtroom. It can be a good, it's not a substitute, it can be an alternative for a situation where the child is too 
uh, sensitive to actually come to the court. So it can be both ways. Um, and it's been really successful in Slovenia so far. Uh, I know the numbers won't sound high for Hungarian people here, but for, for Slovenia, which is really small, these are high numbers. There are currently 66 uh, active ad advocates in Slovenia, and every year 70 children are appointed with an advocate. And um, the stories that you can read in the first initial reports are really promising in terms of uh, how children feel when they express their opinion in, uh, in mostly family law situations. Um, so child advocacy has been really successful in giving voice to children, giving them space to express their views, and of course in implement, implementation of Article 12 of the Convention on um, Children's Rights and of course the European Convention on the Exercise of Children's Rights. However, when it comes to full realization of their child's right to be heard, the final decision is always in the hands of the decision maker. They are the ones giving weight to the child's views. They are the ones um, deciding how much uh, influence the child will have on the final decision. Um, so I think, especially in Slovenia, I can see that this is not the situation here because I, I, I saw some wonderful decision makers here. But in Slovenia, I feel like there's still much more to be done um, to avoid this everlasting and still persistent mentality of we, the adults, know what's best for children. We're going to make the decision for you. So I think um, in, there are still steps to make to make sure that children are really considered as independent right hold holders. So that's it for me. Um, I thank you very much for your attention, and I hope to see you tomorrow as well.